Hey everybody, it's Mr. N here, and <clears throat> this is our first section in calculus, and um, let's see what we can uh, find out about calculus. All right, first of all, the word calculus actually means pebble. It was a pebble, oops, let me uh, erase that and write it correctly, pebble. Uh, it was a pebble that was used by the Romans for calculating um, on a counting board. So they used the pebble to help them out. Um, we, and when they had many pebbles, uh, they, were, they referred to them as uh, calculi. Um, and then we ended up with this word eventually, calculus. Now, if you actually look into um, science and uh, etc., ca calculus is that rock, little rock formation. But going back to the origins of the word, um, it was just a pebble that they used um, on a counting board. And then we have so many other derivatives of the word, calculator, calcul calculation, um, and continuing on with that. And then later in the 17th century, Newton and Leibniz, who were two very famous mathematicians, and I'm sure you've heard of Newton, and we'll talk about Leibniz when we get there, but um, they developed uh, methods of uh, counting um, rates of change and things that are infinitesimal. And so we really uh, ended up with the word infinitesimal calculus, which is what we are going to learn. Um, but we call it calculus now for short. And the word means just that, um, infinitesimal. So you'll have many, many pebbles and continuing on with that. Um, in general, we say that calculus, uh, let's get my lightsaber over here, we'll do the blue one. Uh, calculus, it's very dynamic, so things are going to constantly change. And it's centered with change in motion, and it deals with quantities that approach other quantities. Now, um, this can go back again to 2,500 years to the ancient Greeks when they dealt with the very famous area problem. And um, they found an area, found the area of a polygon by dividing it up into triangles. That was their method of doing it. But what happens when you have something curved? So if you have a curved object and you put triangles in it, well, that's not going to give you a good area. But you keep adding sides to it, you keep adding sides to it, you keep adding sides to it, and then you can make triangles within here by connecting, say, the diagonals. Um, and then you could end up with something with an infinite number of sides um, that'll give you a circle. Now, infinity is something tough to deal with. It's tough to understand. So like there's an ongoing mathematical question. Is a polygon with an infinite number of sides a circle? Some say yes, some say no. And infinitesimal means, well, it's never going to get there. It's going to only get to be a circle at infinity, but infinity is not a number. It's a place. So, uh, the argument there is no, but then the argument is, well, if you take it out that far, it will be a circle. But in any case, if you do find the limit of it, it does end up being the area of a circle, which is pi r squared. And when we start talking about limits, you'll understand what I mean by that. But let me give you an idea of what a limit could be. And this is Zeno's paradox. And here's what he said. Suppose I am here, and we'll say that this is Mr. N. You're going to have to love my drawing here. And I am going to walk to this point over there. But each time I go, I'm only going to walk halfway. So I'll walk to this point. So this is a walk. I'm only going to go halfway each time. Zeno's paradox is, if I only go halfway each time, will I ever reach this point right there where I'm trying to go? So if I only go halfway each time, let's take a look at what happens. On the next one, I'll go to here. On the next one, I'll go to here. And then halfway and halfway. Now, this is where I, in class, I would take a poll for you guys and say, would I ever reach it? Half of you would say no. Half of you would end up saying yes. Well, that's what a limit is. The limit is, if I were to go and continue this forever until infinity, would I get there? At infinity, I would. But in reality, that's a no, because I'm only going halfway each time. So that's kind of 
the representation there of what's going on and what this word infinitesimal means. All right, so that's the bake. That's the little basics of calculus there. Um, so now let's do some review, uh, since now we understand what calculus means and what we are going to study, which is basically rates of change, how things change um, as the equations change or as time continues to change. And because of that, we need to go back to the basics. Let's look at the four ways we can represent a function. So first of all, we have a function f um, right here. And you have been taught to write it as f of x. And we could say that it's a rule that assigns each element x in a set d exactly one element called f of x in set e. So here's one example. The area of a circle depends on the radius. The area is a function of r. So a of r. The area depends on the size of that radius. And that's what it's saying. The area is dependent on the radius. Uh, suppose we are mailing a package. Um, the cost of mailing a package depends on the weight. So uh, now I know now we have like certain sizes and you can fill up as much as you can, but typically the cost depends on the weight. So the cost is a function of the weight. And then we know what the domain is. It's all the possible values of x. We just reviewed that. We know what the range is, all the possible values of y's. The x we typically refer to as the input, and the y values will be the output. Okay? So the ins and the outs, and then we can get into detail later as to what a function is, when something is one-to-one, -one. Um, and basically... Let me just remind you that for a function, it's a rule that assigns each element x to one element. So if I say the ends here, they will all go to one particular. So uh, if I say this is 1 and that's 2, here's 3, there's 4, each one will go to one element in f of x called set e. So for a function, you cannot have the same x branch out to 2 separate y's. But you can have two different x's converge to the same y. This is okay. All right, But this would not be something called a one-to-one -one function. So that's just a quick reminder of that. Now, we have four ways to represent a function. We could do it verbally with words. Let's move to the next page. And we could do it numerically with a table of values. We could do it visually with graphs. So numerically would be our table of values that we have for x and y. Visually would be the graphs and algebraically would be with some sort of explicit function. Now reviewing what a function is, I had just uh, showed you the inputs and the outputs and told you that uh, each one has to go, each input has to go to an output. You can't have the same input branching out to two, to, uh, to two different outputs, but you can have two different inputs going to the same output. What does that mean? Well, that's how we determine a function, and all that visually gives us this vertical line test. So if I were to quickly sketch a function here of some sort, suppose I did a parabola, is this a function? Yes, it is, because if I draw a vertical line, and I'll do it with my lightsaber, wherever I draw it on this graph, it will only cross it one time. If it crosses it more than once, then it is not a function. So for this first one, this one is a function. Let's go ahead and do another example. And how about I do like a sideways parabola like this? Okay, I will take my vertical line, which is my lightsaber. Oh, here's a spot where it crosses it twice. Well, over here it only crosses once, but if anywhere on here I can find a spot where it crosses it more than once, then it is not a function. So, no, this is not a function. As for types of functions, um, suppose we have a piecewise function. Um, we've done these in class. 
And let me remind you, let's go ahead and graph this piecewise function right here. And on this piecewise function, I have a border that happens at 1. So I'm going to kind of lightly put in something at 1 to remind you guys. And when it's greater than 1, um, I will have this parabola. So uh, 0, 0, 1, 1. So it starts at this point, but it's an open circle. And uh, it will continue on parabolically like that. And then if it's less than or equal to 1, then let's use a different color here. Uh, it will be 1 minus x, so it'll have a y-intercept of 1 and a slope um, down 1 over 1. So it will have a point that goes through it right there. And we can graph that end of the piecewise function. All right, step function. Um, over here, I can put my axes and when it's between 0 and 1, right here, the value is 1. So between 0 and 1, the value is 1. It's going to be open there and closed right there. Between 1 and 2, the value is 2. And we have it as open there, closed there. This is at 2. And then it's at 3 right here. When it's between 2 and 3, open and closed. So that would be the step function. We know that the absolute value function will have a V shape to it. So this is the absolute value of X, something similar to that. Um, even function, uh, whenever I put in negative X, I will get F of X the same exact value. So f of x squared is an even function. Let me give you an example with uh, numbers here. If I put in f of negative 5, I'll get an answer. If I put in f of positive 5, I'll get the same exact answer. This is an even function. Odd, on the other hand, I will get the opposite of it. So f of negative x equals negative f of x for every number x in its domain. So negative x cubed, I'm sorry, so x cubed is an odd function. So <clears throat> it, it will also be symmetric to the origin and even would be symmetric to the y-axis. So if you take a look at parabola over here, that's symmetric to the y-axis. So I, I can flip it across this. Odd, for example, that x cubed one would look like this and it's symmetric with respect to the origin, so I rotate it around the origin that way. All right, so again, so for this one, suppose I put in f of 2. Okay, I will get some sort of answer here. And then if I did f of negative 2, I will get negative whatever that result was right there. So they would be opposites of each other. Uh, increasing function, f of x1 is less than f of x2 whenever x1 is less than x2 in some interval. And a decreasing function, f of x1 is greater than f of x2 wherever x1, this is a typo right here, that should be less than f of x2 in i. Let me explain to you what that means. So I have f of x1 and I have f of x2. So over here, I'm going to put some value x1 and I'm going to have some value x2. Now, f of x1 would be right here. And then f of x2 has to be bigger than that, f of x2 right there. And that tells me the function goes up. It's increasing. Do you see that? Whereas in this case... I have the same situation going on. I have x1 less than x2, so x1's here, x2's there. But this time, f of x1 is greater. So f of x1, say, would be up here. Um, this would be f of x1 in this case. For this one, this would be f of x2, because it would be smaller than it. And then that means it would decrease. It's going in a downward direction. Um, a function can be both increasing and decreasing. It just depends on the interval. So let's take a look at this example over here. I'm going to use my lightsaber. And from A to B, closed at A, closed at B, we're going to say that it's increasing. It's going up. 
Now, if I really wanted to get technical with you guys, which we eventually will, and on the AP test, um, there's some things you need to be careful with and some things not so much, um, and I'll explain those to you, that some things are going to be a little bit vague. But on this one, if I'm at the point where it's horizontal like this and it's neither increasing nor decreasing, um, I would have to have an open interval right there. I would have to keep that open, keep these open, and just say on the open interval here what's happening. Um, and for argument's sake, I could do that there, um, just to get a little technical. But from B to C, we know that uh, it's going in this direction, so that's going to be decreasing. So in class, we're going to do <clears throat> the rest of the example problems that we have. But <clears throat> for now, I do want to go over, just summarize what we talked about. Uh, going back to what is calculus again? Well, we knew that it was, um, that we should be calling it infinitesimal. Infinitesimal calculus. Because it deals with infinite quantities, things that change, things that continually change over time. Just like when we did algebra, algebra was more about relationships. In other words, how does <clears throat> x, how is it equivalent to y in a particular equation? So we would say x plus 3y equals 12, those types of things. Uh, we also cover geometry, which you... Uh, uh, you know, you got a lot of proofs out of that, but but geometry, just in a sense, this dealt with shapes. And then <clears throat> when we are in calculus, we will call it infinitesimal calculus. And as we said, this deals with change. So deals with all these things that we've talked about, but as they change over time, typically. All right, so that's what calculus is. Um, there is a lot more to it that's involved, but that's what the basics of understanding what we are going to be doing in calculus, which is dealing with things that change. All right, hope you liked the video. Um, give that uh, like button a big smash. Make sure you subscribe, and I will see you guys in the next video.